many of you, I'm sure in this room, also know them very well. Um, Tagasta and Frida. I was thinking of something witty to say to Tagasta, but I didn't come up with anything because it was giving me a hard time before the panel. Um, I'll get them next time. <laughs> but um, as you guys know, Tagasta and Frida, um, coming from the U.S. Stoughton um, Action Camp, not the Action Camp anymore, the permanent camp, the community, um, the growing community, in that territory that's been stopping multiple pipelines that are planned through uh, with sewage and territory um, in northern BC, including Enbridge and Pacific Trails. And um, Thomas and I and Frida have been here before. Some of you may have heard them speak, but what's really amazing and like inspiring about their struggle is also that it's it's physically building community um, with a real community. For folks that have been up to the action camp is seeing the children, the elders, um, all of the folks that are involved in this resistance in that community is really, really inspiring. Um, and having Tavista and Frida um, representing that and coming and speaking to us is uh, we're really, really, once again, lucky to have them. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to them to talk about their ongoing resistance again to LNG um, pipelines, Pacific Trails being the major one, but obviously a lot more infrastructure in that area um, that they'll speak more about. <laughs> First of all, I would just like to thank the people whose lives we are on. And I'm Frida Houston, for those of you who don't know. And Appointed spokesperson for my hereditary chiefs for the Unistat then, which is uh, known to the rest of the world as Gift Thank You, but with my people that are known as Unistat then. Um, my people have been using and occupying our lands for thousands of years, and just this past four years, we decided to permanently reoccupy our territory that we now have a cabin on and we've been living in for going on three years to better manage and take care of our territory because we couldn't manage it from the reservation because industry and government continue to be dishonest and do everything against our wishes. When we say no, they try to skirt around and sign deals with bank councils and like the difference, the difference with our people is we still have our hereditary system intact and we still have our hereditary chiefs that took the government to court and proved that we had title and rights to our lands. And the band councils have only been around for about 100 years and as of, he's already indicated that it was a system that was imposed on our people. And to me, I've noticed for quite a while that the system has no powers. It's just basically implementing policies, procedures, and legislation that is handed down by the federal government to keep our people off our lands so that they can manage our resources and our territories for their own benefit, not for ours and throw us the crumbs and tell the rest of the world that they're giving our people handouts so that they can create more racism against our people, saying we get handouts. And I said, that's not handouts, that's crumbs from the crumbs from the table. Because industry, the ones that are making money off our lands via the resources, and the government takes some of the crumbs for their use and they throw a little bit of the crumbs to our people and say they're giving us handouts but they're actually just giving back what they've been taken off our land. So, my dad always told us that we had to reoccupy our lands. It's the only way that we could begin to start protecting it. So we've built a cabin right in route to the pipeline. And since then, they have moved their route and like I explained earlier, they're striking deals with band councils. Everybody heard in the media that they got the 16th band to sign, which happens to be the band I come from. 
uh, our van, irregardless of all the people in their community meeting told them no to the project, that we didn't want that project on our territory. They just made deals behind closed doors and went against the people's wishes and decided to sign anyways. Just to get a little bit of money, like crumbs I was saying, but to us we said it didn't matter. They could go ahead and sign deals with the bands. We have the jurisdiction, band councils don't. And We came across a deal that was going to be just before they signed. One of the staff sent us a copy of the draft agreement. And in that agreement, agreement it had a no oil clause in it. Because they've been telling everybody that natural, natural gas is clean, it's safe, it's just going to dissipate into the air if the pipes break. So that's how they've been selling it to a lot of the indigenous communities along the route. So when we saw that no oil clause, it said in there that the PTP could not sell the pipe infrastructure to an oil bitumen company for five years. So why would they put that clause in the agreement if they did not have every intent to turn that into oil? And we've already had that suspicion before we even saw that clause, and when we saw that clause, it just confirmed what our suspicion was that these LNG pipelines were all right from the start plans to transport bitumen because everybody right across BC is against Enbridge and the oil and bitumen pipelines but they got everybody sold on the LNG because they said it's safe but there probably is no plans for LNG pipelines they're just using that to get their pipes in the ground, then they can convert those into oil, and then they got their oil pipelines. That's a prime example of what industry and government, how they operate. And they've operated like that with our people for thousands of years, and I mean, for the last hundred years, and they're not gonna change. And all the, all the history that I've read, I've never seen them do anything honestly. Everything is for their own gain and they disregard the rest of the populace that don't want these projects, but they're going to try and push it through anyways. You hear it over and over again through the media. They'll do everything in their power, creating legislation to criminalize the indigenous people to try and get us out of the way. And we're still here. We survived this long, and we're not going anywhere. And we're just going to continue living on our lands. They can't. I don't like keep calling it a blockade because it's not a blockade anymore where I live, it's, it's my home. I've left my whole home and gave my house over to my daughter and I walked away from that house and now live in that cabin. So that is my home and when I ask what, what will I do if they come and try and remove me from the blockade, I said it's not a blockade, it's my home. I live there. They can't remove me from my home. So now, we're talking about doing more projects, like the last year we put in the bunkhouse, and my family's been talking about doing a healing lodge, because my niece is going to be graduating this May with her PhD in psychology, and her ultimate wish was to build a healing lodge so that she could help heal our people. And our strong belief is if we heal our people spiritually, mentally, and physically, then they'll be whole again. And when you're, when you're connected back to your culture, you're connected to your land. Because we are part of the land, the land's part of us. Without each other, we won't survive. And we strongly believe if we heal our people and then they'll be strong enough to stand up because right now our people have been totally destroyed by residential schools, by the ministry removing our children and then being totally removed from their culture and from who they are. That our people are totally lost. Like a lot of people, like I can even speak for myself, that I, I was spiritually dead, I was physically sick, 
when I tried to live the colonizer lifestyle. I went to school like I was told to go to school. I took a job for 14 years, made all the money in the world, and had a home, paid off five cars, but I wasn't whole. I wasn't happy until I went back to the land, until I started living the way my ancestors lived. And once I started doing that, I got my health back. I had uh, severe allergies that I had to pack an EpiPen around. And I used to wear eyeglasses, and I don't wear eyeglasses anymore. And when I went to the optometrist, he said he's never seen that. My eyes reversed, and I don't need glasses anymore. So that's just an example of how if you live in a land that's still intact, you drink water that's still got its minerals intact, and we don't have to chlorinate our water. And the air is clean there. It's not polluted. You can live a healthy lifestyle. And because the way our planet is being totally destroyed, everybody is sick that is disconnected from the land. Whether you're physically sick, spiritually sick, or mentally sick, it's because of our environment. And all of it feeds into each other that it's causing us to be sick because everything is about money, everything has become a commodity. The, there's no care about the planet, there's no care about the water, the air, everything is about making money. And that's what we're taught from a very young child till we grow up, that that's what we have to do. We have to go to school so we get educated, get a job, pay a mortgage, just to become part of what we call the state. And it's all controlled by 1% of the whole planet is the elite. The rich are only 1% of the whole planet, and they control everything. We are robots just within that system. And the sad fact is what I see, the only way it's going to change is for that system to collapse. And that day is coming soon. And that's why we're doing what we're doing, so that we're we're ready for that collapse. I want to be able to grow my own food so that I'm not dependent on the market to provide me that food. And I want to ensure that my water is still intact so that I have water to drink and be able to sustain my, me and my family on our territory. Because I don't see change happening fast enough that it's going to prevent the economy from collapsing. Because anything you try to do too rapidly, it eventually collapses in on itself. And everything is set up that way, it's going to collapse. And I'm just waiting for that day to happen and doing everything in my power to have myself and my family ready for that collapse. Because the government's not going to change, the system we have is not going to change. It's been running like that for hundreds of years, and our indigenous people have been fighting it for hundreds of years, took it through the legal system, and even if people have won those battles legally, the government still ignores those decisions and still does business as usual. So the only way we see making change for ourselves is to continue to do what we're doing, occupying our land, making it sustainable for ourselves so that we can live without the system because the system's failing. And I don't want to be a part of a failed system that is just destroying the planet with no care of anybody else but themselves. <laughs>